almost overnight the neighborhood changed. I have never seen anything that come from the top of a hill down to a bottom so fast. It was frightening. It was really scary. You reached a point where you felt uncomfortable going outside. You felt uncomfortable sitting in your house with the shades up and the lights on after dark. So then, of course, everybody was up in arms. We had like seven houses on this block that were unoccupied or condemned. We had the gang house, which was really going hot and heavy. So I decided, I didn't decide, I just said to the neighbors, are we gonna put up with this? I know people that live in the suburbs that say, what do we need a block association for? We don't have any crime. I wanna see a neighborhood uh, thriving, a community thriving so that I can bring my kids up here. I think this is a great place and it is being threatened. I think the greatest threat, though, to our communities or to our neighborhoods is our, our um, inability to unite. Staying in your house and being afraid, it's not gonna help you. You have to get out and you have to become involved. We have to stand together, united, um, and say, hey, we will not have you disrupt the quality of life that we have enjoyed. Change is possible in our neighborhoods. All across the country, people are getting together in neighborhood block associations to solve problems and establish friendly and informal working relationships. Block associations help members become assertive users of existing public services. And by working together, citizens can and should expect positive results to neighborhood problems. The Black Club is residents working together to sol solve problems in their neighborhood. Uh, everything from a barking dog uh, to a crack house. Uh, the solution is getting them together to discuss it and taking whatever uh, steps is ne are necessary to resolve it. Uh, utilizing whatever resources are available from the city, but on the other hand, recognizing the importance of the residents themselves, taking responsibility and remedying it if possible and certainly not sacrificing their personal safety in doing so. The first step is always the hardest. Um, sometimes you do feel like you're all alone and maybe having to deal with the problems all by yourself. But I think anybody would be amazed uh, at the amount of good people out there in the neighborhood who want to get involved, who want to know you, and who want to make their neighborhood a better place to live. And it takes a certain amount of risk a certain amount of, of being willing to put yourself out there to, to make the approach to other people, um, to, to do the friendly gesture. Um, and you might get shut down, you might get laughed at, you know, who knows what's going to happen. One of the things that I've done to um, suggest, well, come on, you got to give it a try, is that, oh, it's kind of like voting. You know, you have a stake in things, and um, and give it a shot just once. You will have times when you'll get together for fun, and then you'll also get together to accomplish something that needs to be done. One person is designated volunteers is asked to be the block leader, and every block in our neighborhood has a block leader, and our block happens to have two because they're two people who work very well together, and. We, they will get us all together maybe three or four times a year for informational, educational type meetings. We'll have the police come out and tell us about what's going on, what we should watch for, how we as citizens can keep our neighborhood stable in terms of crime. I didn't know how successful the meeting was going to be, but I got, I would say, at least maybe 10 different households off our block people that I just would not expect that would come out, homeowners as well as renters. Everyone, you know, they didn't know what to expect and I didn't know what I was gonna talk about. It was very informal. And we also had someone from the city council that was there to kind of help and guide us, to tell us what a block club was about. And we've had anywhere from, like as they say, a small meeting of four or five people as to many as maybe 100 meeting at our neighborhood 
recreation centers. The use of those buildings is, is always very helpful because of their size and their location and the availability for parking near and around them. It also gives us a better chance for a forum where we can bring more than one city official to that meeting and probably deal with more than one issue at a given time, which cuts down on the number of meetings people have to participate in, and they appreciate that. So it's a very informal uh, event, but we think it here again gives us the capacity to, to coalesce as a group of people caring about one another, because we really do. But you have to do something to reinforce that caring, uh, particularly when new people come into the block and they don't feel as comfortable here as us oldies do. So we want to do that, do some an activity where that we can, you know, confirm the caring that we have for one another and that we will be concerned if, if somebody needs us for any reason, but we also will have lots of fun together. My role as a leader, or they're called a black leader, um, is rather new. I've only been at it for a month or so. Um, but by what I've seen other black leaders do is mainly um, the nitty gritty stuff of keeping in contact with the community council leaders and uh, knowing what the issues are in the neighborhood. And we do that through uh, flyers usually. I'm kind of a contact person for people in the neighborhood. And being that our neighborhood is used to having involvement, I have people coming up to me and say, I'm, I'm available for this if you need any help. This is a diagram of my neighborhood. Uh, it has all the houses listed on there. Uh, the other things that we asked people on the questionnaire that was sent out a month before this diagram came out was uh, what animals they own, what vehicles they have, uh, in case their animals are loose, in case their vehicle is out when a snowplow is coming. Um, so we wanted to get all the appropriate information so that <clears throat> this could be set by the phone and people could see it immediately and know who was living exactly where, how to contact them instantly if, if need be. Uh, we also have a monthly newsletter. We call it the eavesdropper here in our neighborhood and that's delivered to every house once a month. And we have block news in there so that if there's something important going on in a block, we can put it in there. I really believe in passive things, which are positive, you know, making sure that uh, there's somebody out there by the bus stop. Now, that's, that is a block club thing, making sure that moms go out there or dads or seniors who aren't working at that time, you know, going out there and waiting for kids on the bus to make sure nothing happens and the kids feel safe. That's a really positive, passive thing that you can do as a neighbor. I think the whole key to block club organizing or anything else is learning your agencies. If it's a vacant building, call vacant buildings. If it's environmental health, call them. Don't let somebody else take care of your troubles because they don't live there and they're not interested in it. You do it. If there's dog problems, call the dog pond. I mean, whatever it is, you're networking. And the, these agencies are all listed in your phone books or you can call your councilman or whatever, you know, your elderman, whatever you have and get a list of all these agencies, but you do it. You can't expect somebody else to fight your problems because they don't live there and they don't know what your problems are. If I picked up the phone and called downtown to City Hall to complain about the garbage spilling out of the house down the alley or spilling out of the garage of that house, um, that I'd just be one more, one more guy calling that day and my call would go into the hopper and some clerk would take it down and put it on a piece of paper and set it on that stack with all the other people who had been the sole individual to call about some particular problem around the city. And what we realized through the Block Club was that if you got 10 or 15 people together to call about a single problem, that it has more weight. Um, rather than one person calling in, you have 10 people calling in, and not just calling in for one day, but calling in for four or five or six days running um, because you've all made this deal with each other that you're going to keep calling until something gets fixed. And I think our experience was that on those days when we were calling, we became the biggest squeaking wheel in the city and that um, the things we wanted to get done got done because people saw it was important. There were a number of people who were concerned, and, and though it probably <laughs> unquestionably wasn't the biggest problem in the city on any day we complained, I suspect that's what it seemed like downtown because there were so many people who were picking up the phone and calling to get something done. I think we should know our neighbors and get 
this black club started. And as for the police to get involved, I found out you have to report things. You can't just, you know, let it go. And in the black club, they give you a list of who you report what to. And if you do see anything going on, you have to write it down because, like, if something happens at 2 o'clock in the morning, you write it down and you keep it up and you keep on complaining until something is done. You can't back down. Otherwise, it's not going to get done. The police and the citizen have to work together in order to eliminate the neighborhood problem. The police officer certainly has the law enforcement responsibility, but the resident has the responsibility of bringing that information to the police's attention. The police, if they get accurate information from the neighborhood, neighborhood people, certainly can better fortify their convictions, their arrests and convictions, and eliminate the problem for the residents. Um, I think from a, the point of view of the resident, they're looking for a solution to their problem. The police are looking for a conviction. If you can put the two together, then you've got a great partnership. Our neighborhood certainly has some problems, but we believe that our neighborhood doesn't have as many problems as it could have if we didn't practice some preventative measures. The police tell us that there is no doubt that people who know each other and people who watch out for each other's houses, you can cut down on crime significantly. Police cannot be everywhere, but we as neighbors are everywhere. We have eyes 24 hours a day in this neighborhood. Everybody's got this idea that landlords are not helpful. There are some very strict ordinances on the books for landlords to comply with certain problems, and they are far more receptive to residents than you'd think. And I've actually found that a landlord who's got two properties near me has been my most helpful person. You know, he's told me exactly how to address the city, who to talk to, and things like that, regarding, you know, like drug dealers and things like that. And I just think that one should actually think about talking to a landlord about a problem before getting very angry with them first. Um, I think we've begun to work with the landlords so that they have a notion that they can't just take anybody who shows up uh, to rent their house, that they've got to pay some attention to who they're renting to or the trouble's going to come back to them because we won't leave them alone. Tenants Remedy Act is a law where the courts can take the building away from the landlord, have an administrator appointed that where the, the administrator comes in, does the repairs on the building, then the landlord gets the building back after the proper arrangements have been made for him paying back the loan. If it's a vacated building and it's an eyesore to the neighborhood, then the block club, if they're incorporated and everything, can do the TRA on the building. They have to prove that it's an, you know, that it's an eyesore. Well, any building that's boarded up is going to be an eyesore. And there's always the possibility of vandals, people getting into it and having drug parties in the vacant buildings and this kind of stuff. So that's why they are now allowing black clubs to be the plaintiffs. Because of crack houses and drug dealers who were living in rental properties and dealing drugs out of these properties, the state legislature got together and passed state legislation mandating that landlords who rent to drug dealers, whether or not they knowingly rent to drug dealers or not, but if a drug bust goes down in rental property, that rental property is seized. And it makes landlords have to be more aware of who they're renting their property to. It gives the neighborhood more control of who comes and goes in their neighborhoods. And it makes absentee landlords responsible. And that empowers the neighborhood. And that empowers the people who own property in that neighborhood and who live there. And that was a key legislation that we fought and got passed in our state. That was important. And I hope that they do it on a national level very soon. Together, we got rid of the gangs. They weren't out there selling the drugs anymore. And after the second, um, drug bust at that house 
And after everybody, there had to be 50 people standing out on the street watching these big dope dealers with all their big chunky jewelry laying in the back handcuffed crying like babies. I mean, it was just a thrill for us all. So they weren't so big and tough, and we took every little kid on the block we could find and took them up there and said, you can get a gold necklace, but you also might get your chance to go where they're going. Coming right down to the basic, I think is very important to a youth to be involved, to, to uh, make him feel important or her important. Uh, when these young people are out in the street, they don't feel important. I mean, uh, people look at them, uh, look at this kid, or look at that kid. You know, he's, he's, all he's doing is doing something wrong. You know, there's a lot of good youth out there. We only hear the bad, but we don't hear the good about some of these youth. And I see a lot of good in some of these youth. All they need is a little love. Give them a little hand. Get them involved in something. Get them off the street. There's a way to solve everything. Get your little kids and let them, show them how important they can be. They're patrolling that, and boy, they're not afraid to squeal. And if some, look at our streets. If somebody throws something down, even the littlest kid will say, you pick it up. I mean, they're learning responsibility, and that's the next generation that's going to be our leaders. And there's where we got to start. I remember when I was a kid, I started smoking. I was eight blocks away. And uh, when I came home, my mother said, give me a cigarette, boy. What? Those cigarettes in your sock. So how did she know that? And later on, she told me, yeah, Mrs. So-and-so called up and said, you were smoking cigarettes. And uh, it's not so much squealing or tattling, but you had a sense of community. If someone seen you doing something, they would call your parents and let them know that you were acting up. I like to believe that what we're doing for young people now, you notice all the children around here, that we're giving stability to these people, we're giving some continuity to them, we're giving some caring so that these young people with their children know that neighborhoods really do mean something. There was a time, I think, probably in the 60s and 70s when they, we were so mobile that people really didn't understand the value of neighborhood. Uh, we all moved every two or three years for lots of very good reasons, but I think it cause some real instability in, in communities. I think we're going back, and certainly in our neighborhood, I think represents the going back to the stability of community that I think has a great deal to say about living in the central city. If you want to live safe and uh, be a good neighbor, I we encourage that everyone should help each other out because without your help or my help, we can't be a good neighbor or we can't live in a safe place. Belonging to the association makes me feel that I'm, I'm an owner of the community and the area and the city and the people in it and the institutions around me rather than just this one little 40 by whatever it is, 120 foot lot with a building on it. I'm not a, I'm not a prisoner in my own little property now. I'm a member of the community. I know the members of the community. I know the leaders in the community. And, it, and it's a better feeling. you got a choice, you know. If you enjoy being barricaded in your own home, almost calling for a police escort when you want to go to the store, when you could, by joining with your neighbors, help to alleviate that situation, then that's a choice you have to make. I mean, you, you can't force anybody to do that. You, 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 you've got to... Uh, you can give them all the reasons why, but then basically in, uh, the bottom line is what sort of lifestyle do you want to live in a given neighborhood? Myself, I've never felt that uh, I would like to, to, to feel that I'm a captive in my own home. We can't sit back and continue to take it and take it and take it. We can't because it's not going to stop. Only we can stop it. So those of you who are afraid, come out. Come to a meeting, voice your opinion, voice your concerns, and let the people know you're not going to take it anymore. Things don't always turn over as quickly as you would like them to. 
and sometimes you want that wheel of progress to go just a little bit quicker. And you get frustrated sometimes. But in the final analysis, even though slow, being involved is really worthwhile and it's worth it for me. Patience is important because it takes a lot of hard work and a, quite a long time. In my case particular, it took me nine months to finally win the TRA, the Tenants' Remedy Act, against my landlord. And it, like I say, it was 43 code violations just on the, on the building. Like I said, many nights I just cry myself to sleep. Sometimes I just paced and walked all night. And it, it was hard. It was really hard. But I did it. I showed him I'm not afraid of him. <laughs> I won what I wanted to win. And it made me feel good. That he couldn't push me around. We don't have to make it so sophisticated. I think people get intimidated because they think, oh, if I get involved in this or if I do this, I have to have um, a master's degree to do it. It doesn't take that. It just takes simple, everyday folks who have their hearts in the right place to get out here and get involved and make a difference in the neighborhood. What we found here is that, um, you know, all of us really do want the same thing. Um, we recently had a day when we could get rid of all the garbage in our, in our alley, all the garbage and the brush. And, you know, everybody came out to help on it. The, um, you know, the black guys, the white guys, the Hmong guys, the Ethiopians, we're all out helping to cut this stuff down and haul the trash away because it serves all our interests. And when you can get a chance to work together with people like that, people see that you do all want the same thing, that you all really do want the place to be clean and to look nice and to be safe for your kids, and that there aren't those immense barriers that you like to imagine there are between people when you're just sitting in your house by yourself. You get together with other people and realize that you all want more or less the same thing and that you can work together to get it. When you have numbers, you have power. When you're talking, when, you, when you're a single voice, it isn't heard as loudly as a united voice. That's why a choir is always going to be stronger than a single vocalist, you know? There's just more power in that. And that kind of power is what gets officials elected or voted out of office. It's what gets city ordinances passed. It's what gives people an opportunity to make changes in their own lives. And that's what being part of a neighborhood block is. It gives you a sense of power. It gives you a sense of, hey, this is, this is more than just where my house is. This is my neighborhood. This is my home. And these people in this neighborhood are part of my family.